How's everybody doing? So listen, before we start this thing, why don't everybody come down here? Let's make this a little more homey. Like. Let's make it intimate. Come on up. Come on don't shy. No, I'm not come shy. Sit up. Come, sit. Come, sit. come closer. So I don't need these dumb, we don't need these stupid mics. Can we come closer? We do need the mics. Come on, come on. Hey, we don't come on. always get this option. Shh, quiet. I'm not talking to you. Wait, I'll get you in a minute. That's it. How about you guys back here? Would you come closer? Come on, darling. Come on. Blondie, get on up here. Come on. Then we don't need this mic. Come on, Blondie. We leave. Good, good. Moving slow, but you're moving. I love it. All right, great. Okay. All right. So, up on the stage here with me now, if you don't know this man, you probably don't know a lot about football or <laughs> any really good movies. <laughs> but the gentleman joining me now is Fred the Hammer Williamson. Yeah, what's up? <laughs> well, how are you doing, man? You doing the show so far? Dude, I'm always doing good. I got no other problems. Man. Why shouldn't I be doing good? I'm in, I'm in a nice city. It's snowing outside. I mean, it's very romantic out there. I might fall in love if I leave the city. <laughs> right up. Um, so, if you guys don't know, um, the man has starred in many films from like Dusk Till Dawn. He was also in Starsky and Hutch. Um, I started about 90 films. I produced about 75 of them. I've directed about 40. Uh, my career started with uh, Julia. I played 12 years of pro football first. After football, uh, I worked for Bechtel Steel as an architect. So I'm an architect and engineer as well as an ex-football player. Once I stopped playing football and full-time as an architect, I couldn't make the transition. Nine to five and now for did not fit my personality. One night I was watching television and I saw Dan Carroll at a show called Julia. She was the first black actress to have her own television series. Thank you. And I noticed that each week, the guest star role was a new boyfriend. And I said to myself, I'm better looking than any of those guys. I'm going to Hollywood to become Dan Kill's boyfriend. <laughs> Took me a week to accomplish that. And they signed me to a three-year contract to be Dan Kill's boyfriend on the Jewish show. That was my first job. We were shooting at the uh, Century Fox lot. I was in the commissary one day, and a guy walks by and he says, I'm doing a movie. I got a football scene in it, I don't know anything about football, but you can direct I put all the football stuff together, and the guy was Robert Altman, and the movie was The Mash. So my first movie was The Mash. I was Spear Chuck and Jones in the movie Mash. Producer of the movie was Ingo Primington. So Ingo came to me and he says, my brother's got a movie going. He's looking for a tall Italian guy, muscular guy, but he couldn't find any, so I'm going to take him and introduce you to my brother, which was Otto Primitive. So I went and met Otto. So my next film after that was Tell Me Love Me, Junie Moon with Liza Minnelli. After that, I said, it's easy, man. I should have been doing this all the time. I said, it's easy. You make this much money? You got to remember, when I was back in the day, I was number two draft choice of the San Francisco 49ers. My signing bonus was 1900 and my starting salary was 9500 That's what they were paying back in the day. My buddy Jim Brown never made $100,000 in one season. As long as he played, he never made $100,000. I made more than that in the movie Mesh. I made 75000 in the movie Mesh. And uh, I said, I should have been doing this a long time ago. So after that, I just said, you know, if I'm going to come into the business, i got to come into it on my own terms. The same way I was playing pro football, I was the hammer. I played the game according to the way that I felt it was right for me. I was the first player to white, wear white shoes long before Joe Namath. The league fined me $100 a game for wearing white shoes. Said I was breaking the dress code of, of, of the team. So it cost me $100 a game to play. So I said, okay, that's okay. I mean, I, people go to the football games. If you got a favorite football team right now, you really know who throws the ball. Catch the ball, who runs the ball. You don't really know the defensive backs. I bet you got a favorite football team now. Now, if I ask you to name me the four defensive backs, you couldn't. You might get two of them. You might get three. You're not, you're not gonna get all four. They, they don't get the notoriety. But the guy with white shoes called himself the hammer. They actually know who he is. 
He's out there strutting like a peacock. Okay? So I was thinking about marketability. I was thinking about life after football. So I've been able to put that to use. So I'm the hammer. I'll always be the hammer, and I'm known as the hammer by people who don't even know I play football. I'm the hammer. Okay? All right. Questions out there? <laughs> Anybody got questions? Go ahead and start opening up some questions. Anybody got some questions? I got the hammer. Anything you want to ask? I don't really care what it is. I got answers to everything. The yeah. man is open. Come on up to the mic and ask the man yeah, a question. Exactly. From there, dude, go. <laughs> What's your question? No, no, no. <laughs> Come up there. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, good actually, you guys. I mean, good actually, you did, and I think that's a good show. Which one? Uh, we played the. Uh, Bad the, 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 Yeah. Yeah. Dust yeah. Dunk. Yeah. What's your question? Well, I think uh, anybody actor that you had, had on TV or in the movies, uh, even from real, uh, no, good, yeah, he was a good actor. Yeah. So what about him? I agree with you. Yeah. I'm a good actor. I agree with you. Well, see, there, yeah, she. Had, yeah. I think for Mel Gibson and you yeah. and everybody else out there, the good actors and anything they ever did. I think that's a good show. That was a good movie. I appreciate the compliment. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So you have some projects coming up right now, don't you? Yeah, my next movie. I do a lot of work in Europe. I do a lot of work in Spain, Germany, Italy. I'm a pretty, I'm even a bigger star in Italy and in Europe than I am in America because in America, I'm a black actor. In Europe, I'm an action star. It's a big difference. Where how they treat my movies and how they play my movies overseas is different. Uh, I'm off to back. I, I live in Rome. I live in Rome part time. I have a place in Rome, so I'm off to Rome in about a month to do a film called The Last Hitman with Franco Nero. So my image in, in Europe is like Dirty Harry. I'm a badass with a badge. That's how they book me and that's how they call me. In America, it's, it's different. You know, they want to play my my movies in so-called black market, which is Chicago, New York, Kansas City. They play it in the so-called key markets where the black population is. And that limits the box office in the movies. So I'm not really happy about that, but that's not going to change. Can you tell us more about The, the Last Day Man? No, I have to kill you. <laughs> What's up, bro? You got that question? You want to be next? No, no, you stand up. Yeah. I was just saying, going all along that line of shopping is uh, with the, like you said with the black exportation films. Yeah. Uh, could you expand a little bit on that and how that came about and how it became very successful and look that look back to that now that's going like those some of the best movies out there. Yeah I got a lot of knowledge to tell you to tell you about the black exportation movies what they call black exportation. I never really understood what it meant. Uh, it was created by the studios, the studio system. Any film that had a black star was called black exportation movie. Uh, I didn't fit in, in that genre because, unfortunately, the, the black stars, once they became popular enough to star in a movie, they did something that self-destructive. They, movies were about retribution. Let's get back whitey. Let's do to whitey what they did to us. My movie wasn't like that. I killed white people, black people, yellow people, pink people. I killed everybody. <laughs> you were bad, you went down. So I didn't fall into that category because I saw what was happening. I was smart enough to realize it was going to be short-lived. Yeah. And it was short-lived. They didn't like my movies because if my movie played on 85th Street in New York, I've got a line around the block. And my movie probably cost a million, million five. I've got a line around the block. Across the street is a major studio who's got a $90 million over there and nobody's in it. So I was competing with them. I was taking money away from the major studios. So they are the ones who really created this terminology, black exploitation, to kill the movies that were taking profits away from them. Even though some of the movies were bad, they were still making money. What they did was discover a new audience. There was a black audience out there waiting and dying to see heroes, to see the blacks playing the Bond kind of character, the gender, the Eastwood kind of character. They were dying for this kind of character. And they showed major studios that there was a market that they had been missing. So once they killed the so-called black exploitation movies, then they created a Denzel Washington. Then they created Samuel Jackson. Then they created, it's about five actors that, that, are, that, they, that are black that work all the time. I mean, Samuel Jackson plays everybody. 
whatever black role there is, they read page 35, and there's a, it says a black man walking to the room, they go, oh, Samuel Jackson. Because that's as far as their mentality expands. They don't know anything outside of them. They the, listen, they're on the 20th floor making movies about what they think the black public is going to like. They have no idea who the black public is. How do you know? What, if you can't make a movie for the Mexicans if you don't understand Mexican mentality or black mentality or Puerto Rican mentality? So they bring one brother, one black man, and it's going to do it. So that, that works to a certain extent, but now it's overdone. I mean, every time you look in a movie, it's a black boy with Samuel Jackson. He can't be every brother. <laughs> it don't work that way. Exactly. He's in Tarzan. All right, girl, you'll you, be you dying to get up there. What you got to say? I hear what you want to say. It makes me really sad. What? What makes you sad? That's black explanation. I'm okay. You black. But in a moment when I talk to you, it's my my way. I'm raised. I'm a skipper's daughter. I've been all around in the world too. Not maybe in all our countries, but yeah. around the world. I have seen people what they are on the, the attitude and not looking the color. And I feel sad after you say that. What of the question? I'm surprised this question. I never hear this black expectation or what this is. But now you're educated. Now you're and, and no, I feel really sad. I mean, you have the same. This has nothing to do with. But I'm not color. saying. No, you have the same talents. There has nothing I'm to do with colors. The, that doesn't bother you. And the other time is the first time I saw you. I recognize on your posters when you're signing. I came in the military, I spoke no English to my ex-husband, and this was smash was the first time I saw it. That's because I'm good looking, I understand. Huh? <laughs> good, yeah, you look really good. I saw you post that, right? You was a handsome cookie. But that's the difference between black and white. If you're handsome, it doesn't really matter what color you are. No, I'm not looking. I'm looking the moment the person, that you look handsome, I don't care. You're black or green and swat. I don't know what. You have like green feet. You know, no matter. That's why I wear and shoes. then you look aliens from Mars. That's why I wear shoes, baby girl. What's your question? Anyway. <laughs> so, no, uh, the question is, um, you will doing uh, movies doing for end your life, or that you have set you an age where you say, I did enough, I tried to do something what I need, and do only movie when I need. So, when you you decided something going to tie it, or you'd like to this end your life made it movie. Some people say after... What's your question? Yeah, my, my question is well, when you like get maybe you like retired or that you do a lifetime. Breaks, basically, between the, your, each of your films, are you are you usually pretty quick to jump on the next project? Or anything like that? Yeah, or that over time, say I've been 80 and I retired, I make no more movies, or you like do this for a whole bunch of life. Cause... Uh, do you want it until you die? Okay. You done? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. No, I have a pleasure beating up people. It's a good thing. <laughs> I have to live up to the hammer. And that's what they like to see me do. Uh, remember Woody Strode? Woody Strode, I think Woody Strode died at like 92. I did a movie called Vigilante. And Robert Forster was in the movie. And Robert Forster was in prison for something. And he was in the shower. And these bad guys were in the shower with him. Everybody's naked. They're looking at Robert Forster. So it was, kind, it, was, it was kind of assumed that something was getting ready to happen. These guys were going to jump on Robert Forster. All of a sudden, a black hand came into the shower, grabbed one of these big guys, and punched him a John Wayne punch in the mouth. Bam! Camera cut to him. You see who it was? Woody Strode. Here's Woody Strode, 85 years old, beating up some people. Audience went crazy. I mean, he just went wild. And then he said to Robert Forster, you can go now, I'll take care of this. That's, that's selling an image. That's an image that don't change. You know, he could be 95 as long as he can throw a punch. It's Woody Strode. That's the way I want to be remembered and envisioned that once I step into the screen, you know what you're going to see. I don't sing, I don't dance, I don't tell jokes. I'm not funny. Not that I'm not funny in private life, but I know what I'm selling. I know what my brand is. I sell a brand. I'm like the black Clint Eastwood or the black Charles Bronson. Those are the kind of roles that I play, and that's the character that I, that I show on the screen. More questions? Anybody else got a question? Come on, dog. You got one. Madame? Hello. Go for it. What's football? What's your name? Oh, what was football like? Okay, that's a great question. Thank you. Football is, is a great lesson in life. You can be down 21 to nothing, and if you have faith and confidence in your team, 
you can still win the game 22 to 21. That's what football did for me. It gave me the confidence to achieve goals. It gave me the confidence never to give up. It doesn't really care what people think about you as long as you do the job. That's all that matters. You're hired to do a job. You're not hired, you don't hire players to love your coach. The coach doesn't have to love you either. As long as you're doing the job, you're number one on the team. And that's the most important thing about sports. It, it teaches you camaraderie. It teaches how to get along with your fellow man. Even if you don't like him, you need him. So if they put in a black actor in a role, they wanted somebody to a black society to come and pay, pay money. That's why they put them in there. Right? It's not out of love, not trying to show uh, that they're kind-hearted people. They're looking at the Dhamma side. And it's all about the money. Hollywood is all about money. That's why they're so confused. It's all about money. I don't live in Hollywood. I couldn't stand these people in Hollywood. If I was in Hollywood, I'd be in jail. I'd be beating up somebody every day. Man. I live in Palm Springs. I live about 150 miles outside of Los Angeles. So it's a different society. It's, it, it's tough, you know. They only know themselves. They live in a shell. Hollywood is a shell. And the people who live there all think the same way, which, which means they don't think at all. They just go along with the trend. That's Hollywood. What do you think it would take to break that shell? A bomb. <laughs> but, okay, but on the follow-up on that, I do agree with you. He said it was about money. Get out and make money. Um, do you think that they'll eventually realize that they're missing out on money? No, because you know I've made I've made films that have top. I made original gangsters for me and five. And original gangsters made forty million. You know what they said? I was lucky. It doesn't. They don't appreciate the fact that I gave the people something they wanted to see. I put Jim Brown, Pam Greer. Richard Roundtree, Ronald Miller, put everybody in the same movie for a million five. The movie made $40 million. And they said I was lucky. I haven't been able to raise money to do the sequel. And that's over 10 years ago. So what happens? Stallone calls me after we finish the movie and he says, how is it working with all your friends? I said, it's great, man. I mean, if you pay them, everybody is happy. Individually, Jim Brown and Pam Greer and Roundtree had lost their markability. But together, as a package, it was remarkable. Stallone now is on number 13 of indispensables to undisposables or whatever that sucker is. Okay? That's the difference, man. I'm lucky. Any other questions? I uh, show me, you saw me yesterday, your football ring. How are you feeling you got them to, uh, after the game? I was too, I was not a baby, so I don't know how to give a, a question yesterday when you tell me it's your football ring, how proud you was to that the first day, how you did that party, or the hide the ring, or what you did. Well, what was it like when you got that first Super Bowl ring? Thank you. Um, I played in the first Super Bowl, and the first Super Bowl ring means, it just, it means what you work so hard to do that you're among the best of the best. You're one of the best of the best. That's why you be supposedly become a professional. That doesn't exist today. Like I said, I was never, I was never too drive choice and I made 9,500. 9, that was it. These guys are all millionaires and they couldn't make the team back in the day when we played. Because now, you are as good as your agent can negotiate. How many, tro how many Heisman Trophy winners turn out to be good professionals? Rarely, rarely. Maybe two every five years who, who are Heisman Trophy winners become good professionals. But they're all millionaires because they're, they're marketed that way. It's not about ability now all the time. It's about how good you can negotiate. And the game has changed because of the money. Money has changed the game. Because like what you said, in your day, it was, you were making thousands a year compared to what they're making now, the millions. Yeah, but see, back in the day, you played for the pride. You played to be one of the best. Because if you got chosen to be a professional, that means you were good. <coughs> if you got chosen today, it means you got a good agent and you're making more money than anybody else on the team because your agent has gotten you a big contract. That doesn't mean you're gonna live up to it. Why don't they pay these guys money after they live up to it? 
get your 10 million contract and your 15 minute contract after you show me that you can make the team. They just come in and they just have to exist and they pick up paychecks. Back in the day, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. You had to do what they paid you to do and you had to be a real professional. And not only that, you had to act like a professional. If you didn't, you got sent home. They didn't care about who you were. If you didn't act like a professional, you got sent home. Today, now, I would like to, I don't know, I'm gonna say this, and I don't really care how anybody feels about this, but all these guys who are kneeling on the national anthem, I would like to see a photo of three guys kneeling in front of the flag and three Marines behind them, wetting them down. You know, I would like to see that. Uh, I'm a former Marine too. That just, uh, I mean, that gets to me, man. When I see these guys kneeling to the national anthem, and nobody's saying anything. Everybody's saying it's not right. Well, if it's not right, do something about it. The commissioner's saying he doesn't like it. The owners are saying we don't like it. But there are no changes. Only one, one owner steps up to the plate, Jerry Jones. And he said, I'm your boss. I sign your checks. You do what I say about this, or we will send you home no matter who you are. We will cut you. He's the only one who stepped forward and said that. So I think more should say that the commissioner should say something a little more stronger than he has to say. Hi. Right. Any other questions? Make a point, though. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't care about what I say. I ain't worried about it. But can't do it to me. Yeah. You well, know? It's about it. Yeah, I've already, like you said, this will talk to the remaining to the place. So what in the heck is going on there? You know? But then, Listen, if you, if you took each one of these players who kneel and asked them why they're doing it, they all have different reasons, and all the yeah. different reasons makes no sense. Yeah. So that means there's no unity about what they're doing. Yeah. They're just complaining about something. Yeah. yeah, more questions. Come on, guys. Who's going to win the game today? Which game? There's a lot of them being played, though. Redskins and Seahawks today. Who's playing? Redskins and Seahawks. Who cares? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, see. Who cares? Redskins and CEO. Who cares? <laughs> so I actually have a couple questions. Um, one, um, oh, when it comes to your, your career between football and acting, is there one you actually like to do more? Uh, probably football is number one because you don't, you're not playing to be liked by anybody. You're playing to do the best that you can. Sometimes to get a role in a film, you have to be liked or you have to do certain things that Weinstein is a certain example of what's happening to him in his life. Things that some of the actors and actresses had to go through to get a role, I suggest that they go through. This, this, this has been going on for years and it's still going on now. You know? I mean, I, my biggest disappointment was when I, when I was in Hollywood the first year I had lunch at the commissary in Universal Studios. So I go into the commissary and the waitress there gives me a nice seat because she thought I was cute. So I got a nice seat. I'm sitting there and my hero, Wyatt Earp, hero brand, walks in, looks at me and sits beside me and he says to me, you're kind of cute. <laughs> I says, Oh, really? He says, yeah, you're a good looking guy. I've never seen you here before. You're kind of cute. The waitress saw what was going on. She came over and she said, uh, Mr. Williamson, we have a phone call. I said, wow, who's phone? Who's, who knows who I'm here? Huh? She says, no, no, we really have a phone call. So I get up and she takes me away to where, you, where the interest is. And she says, you don't have a phone call. I'm just getting away from Mr. O'Brien. I said, this is Hollywood. Kidding me, this is really this is really how it is. I'm brand new to this place, man. I would have if I thought he was hitting on man, I'd knock him out. <laughs> but I left. I just left the, the commissary. I mean it has been going on for years. People don't talk about it. They just now starting to talk about it. It's been going on for years. So um got time for does anybody else have any questions out here? Yeah. Come on up.
be asking a hypothetical question. You're all hypothetical. Because <laughs> a lot of uh, superhero movies you know, coming out, a lot of popularity, and you know, those kind of movies. So if you could choose one superhero character, which one would you like to play? My superhero character is, thank you very much, good question. It hasn't changed since day one. When I first decided that I was going to come into Hollywood, and I saw what Hollywood was after I did, did a MASH and after I did Tell Me Love Me to the Moon. And then I was ready to create an image. So I made a press conference and I called all the press in and I said, I'm coming to Hollywood and I'm going to be make a, a big impact on Hollywood. But I have three rules that Hollywood has to adhere to. One, you can't kill me in a movie. Two, I have to win all my fights in a movie. Three, get the girl at the end of the movie if I won. Now I said, you gotta do two out of three of those. Now I know damn well they wanna give me the woman. That wasn't gonna happen. So now, for sure in a movie, I'm not gonna die, and I'm not gonna lose a fight. Because I sell an image. If I lose a fight, I'll never be able to walk in the ghetto again. Man, I'm waiting at that little guy beat you up. And if I can't explain it, then they're gonna say, oh, you sold out, man, you did it for money. We just paid you to get beat up like that. It ain't happening. It ain't happening. Uh, my pride is, is, is strong, my integrity is strong, and my integrity is not for sale. I, I, lose, I lose a lot of work now, man. Every, every month I get to offer a job, maybe 500,000, 600,000 to do a movie. And before I read the script, first thing I said, do I die? Well, yeah, you get to. Conversation's over. I'm, I'm not interested. Well, can you change it? No, well, this character is overwritten that he gets killed. He does good things, but at the end he gets killed. I said, no, no, no. Death to dawn, I died, but I died as that ugly thing. I didn't die as the hammer. I went down as that the sex machine bit me on the neck and turned me into a damn vampire. <laughs> so if I die as a vampire, I go as a vampire, but I'm not going as the hammer. But before I went down, I must have killed about 20 of them suckers in the Titty Twister Bar, if you remember. <laughs> I took a few of them with me before I went. So, that's my answer to that question. All right, well, I want to thank you guys all for coming out here to see Fred the Hammer Williamson, and I want to thank you, Hammer, yeah. for coming up and speaking with us. Good. Make sure right. you guys go check him out at his table against the wall over there.